you turn back to Mark chapter 15, I've entitled this evening's message, The Young Man in the Linen Cloth. Now, how many times have you read that passage of Scripture and wondered, why was he just wrapped up in a sheet? And that is what this refers to. As a matter of fact, the only time this word is used, this linen cloth that he was wrapped in, is when Joseph of Arimathea wrapped the Lord in cloths like this. The young man in the linen cloth. Let's read verses 51 and 52 again. And there followed him, the Lord Jesus Christ, a certain young man. I love that word certain, don't you? <laughs> it's throughout the scriptures. He always has certain people that he saves. There's nothing generic about the gospel. And there followed him a certain young man having a linen cloth cast about his naked body. All he had on was a sheet. And the young men, the soldiers, laid hold on him. They saw him following Christ. And he left the linen cloth and fled from them naked. Now only Mark gives this detail in the four Gospels. And the writer does not say this, but most agree that this is Mark's autobiographical statement with regard to himself. Mark is saying by this, I was there. I was there. I was a witness to this. I think it is interesting. Mark is careful not to use his name. He just identifies himself as this young man with a linen cloth. And I think that modesty caused that. It's very much like John calling himself the disciple that Jesus loved. Now that's what I want to be more than anything else. The disciple that Jesus loved. Religious people would say, well, that's the disciple that loved Jesus. But that's not the way John stated it. The disciple that Jesus loved. Now, I feel sure that this is Mark speaking, letting us know what had taken place. Now, would you turn with me to Acts chapter 12? What about this man, John Mark? In Acts chapter 12, after Peter was released from jail, for preaching the gospel, he went to a certain home. And we read with regard to the place that Jesus went to that the house where the disciples were gathered praying for him, John Mark's mother owned it. So that's the first we read of John Mark. His mother owned this house that the church was together praying for Peter and his release. And many think that this was the same house that the Lord ate the last Passover and the first Lord's Supper with his disciples. And that makes some sense into this speculation that I'm giving. I know this is speculation, and somebody says, why well, give it? Well, I don't know. I'm going to give it anyway. And uh, it's not in the Bible, but I think it's a reasonable conjecture. As I said, many think this was the same house that the Lord ate the last Passover, so Mark was there. Mark was there. And when Judas was going to betray the Lord, this was the last place Judas knew of him being. And he perhaps first went there, and when the Lord wasn't there, he knew, well, he oft times goes to Gethsemane. The scripture actually says he oft times resorted there Judas knew that place. So perhaps Judas went there to Gethsemane and most 
writers, I would have never come up with this, this is what commentators have said, they said John Mark got up immediately, being woken up by all this, knowing that the Lord was getting ready to be betrayed, so he took his bedclothes and wrapped himself in it, not even taking the time to get dressed, to run and warn uh, the disciples and the Lord Jesus concerning what was going to happen. Now, did that happen? I don't know, but it's a reasonable conjecture. But here we have this young man wrapped in this linen cloth. The soldiers perceived he was following Christ and they laid hold upon him. Um, Charles Spurgeon said that uh, the reason he recorded this of him running away because he was getting ready to tell of Peter and his fall. And he was going to go into detail about it and he's letting everybody know that he's writing to, I'm just as bad as he is. Look what took place with me. I fled in cowardice just like all the rest of the disciples, and that may be. <clears throat> Some have wanted to call the Gospel of Mark the Gospel of Peter, because Peter, he goes on to say with regard to Mark, he's my son. No doubt Mark learned the Gospel through this man, Peter, and Peter narrated to Mark the three years that he spent with the Lord, and that's how Mark comes up with this thing concerning the gospel. And most people think Mark is the first gospel written down, and God used this man Mark, or John Mark, to write the first gospel. The Lord prepared this man for this purpose, to write the first gospel. Now, as I said, we read of him first in Acts chapter 12, uh, his mother owned this house. And would you turn to Acts chapter 12 for a moment? This is when Peter has left the prison and he's going to this house. Verse 11, and when Peter was come to himself, he said, Now I know of a surety that the Lord has sent his angel and hath delivered me out of the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the people of the Jews. And when he considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of of John, whose surname was Mark. And this is where these people were gathered together praying for the release of Peter. Look in Acts chapter 13, verses 2 and 3. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. This is talking about Paul's first missionary journey and Barnabas. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. And look down in verse 5. And when they were at Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogue of the Jews. And they also had John to their minister. That's not talking about the apostle John. That's talking about John Mark. He went with them on this first missionary journey. Now look down in verse 13 of chapter 13. And when Paul and his company loosed from Paphos, they came to Perga in Pamphylia, and John departed from them. Now that word is deserted. There wasn't anything good about this. John, this is the man who wrote the Gospel of John at this time, he deserted. That's a serious thing. He deserted. I don't know what the reason was, but the word used lets us know it was nothing good. He deserted. He played the coward, he chickened out, I don't know what took place, but he was gone and he went back to Jerusalem. And you know that uh, Mark was the cause of the conflict between Paul and Barnabas. Uh, remember, Mark was Barnabas' nephew. Look in chapter 15. And some days after, Paul said unto Barnabas, this is after Mark had already deserted, this is his next missionary trip, and some days after, Paul said unto Barnabas, let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord, and see how they do. And Barnabas determined to take with them John, 
whose surname was Mark. That was his nephew. Maybe there was some nepotism going on. I don't know. But he wanted John to go with him. But Paul thought not good to take him with them, who departed. He deserted them from Pamphylia and went not with them to the work. He had proved himself to be unreliable and unfaithful, and Paul did not want him going. And the contention was so sharp, verse 30, the contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder one from another. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed into Cyprus, and Paul chose Silas and departed, being recommended by the brethren unto the grace of God. Now, who is in the wrong here? I'm not going to spend much time with this, but who is in the wrong here? Well, Paul was, ends up being wrong because he goes on to say, John, bring John Mark to me. He's profitable to me for the ministry. So evidently he was wrong, but yet he was right. Huh. He deserted. Can't you understand why he didn't want to bring him? I can certainly understand that. So you could make an argument that he was right. You could make an argument that he was wrong. What about Barnabas? Well, evidently Barnabas was right and wanted to take him because Paul ends up saying, I want John Mark involved in the ministry. And evidently Barnabas was right. Um, Barnabas probably should have shown deference to Paul too, shouldn't he? He should have listened to what Paul said. He was wrong. You know, in something like this, they were both right and they were both wrong. And isn't that the way it always is in conflict? Always. I mean, there's different points of view. There's different ways of looking at things. And it's so sad that they had a contention that was so sharp, the scripture said they parted asunder. <clears throat> Thank God this contention did not last. Turn to Colossians 4 for just a moment. The reason I'm giving this information is to set up Mark being the author of the Gospel of Mark and what the Lord brought him through to teach him this. But look in Colossians chapter 4. Verse 10. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, saluteth you, and Marcus. He was evidently with Paul at this time. The sister's son to Barnabas. He mentions Barnabas. That was Mark's nephew. Touching whom you received. Commandments, if he come unto you, receive him. If I send Mark to you, receive him. I've got some special instructions for this church that you need to hear. Now this lets us know that this contention, and I'm so thankful for this, this contention between Paul and Barnabas did not last. When he wrote this letter in Colossians, it was quite a few years after that took place, and he was writing from a Roman prison cell. So I remember hearing somebody said one Paul crossed Barnabas, or once Barnabas crossed Paul, you never hear from him again. Yeah, you do. <laughs> yeah, you do, and I'm thankful you do, aren't you? Um, turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4. And look what Paul says with regard to this man Mark. Verse 11, only Luke is with me. Take Mark, this one that at one time I said, I don't want him coming. He deserted us. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. Now, remember when he was writing this letter just a few verses earlier, he said, the time of my departure is at hand. He knew he would soon be dying, and he wanted Mark to be involved in this thing of the ministry. And I'm going to say some things about that in a moment, but one of the things that uh, most people use uh, Mark as an example of is that God is a God of second chances. You know, I don't like that. I don't like that at all. God, if you get a second chance, you know what you're going to do? You're going to blow it. Me too. I guarantee you. And that's a wrong language to use the, 
of God in the first place. He doesn't, he's not a God of chances or second chances. He's a God of absolute purpose. And everything he does is on purpose. And everything that Mark was going through was on purpose to bring him to the place where he was going to be able to write Mark. Oh, the glory of the gospel. But he said with regard to Mark, take him and bring him with thee, for he's profitable to me for the ministry. And the ministry he's talking about is the ministry of the gospel. I came across an acrostic uh, this week that I loved so much. And um, an acrostic is where you have kind of like tulip, you know, you have a word and you give a word that total depravity, unconditional, you're familiar with that. But I, I saw this in the Grace Baptist Bulletin. It didn't have an author. I don't know who came up with this, but I love this acrostic gospel. G, grace. O, omnipotent grace. S, saving grace. P, particular grace. E, eternal grace. L, lasting grace. Isn't that good? I'd like to use that as an outline for a message one of these days because that is the grace of God. What a, this is what Paul said he was profitable for me for, the gospel of the grace of God, God's saving grace. And Paul went on to say in Philemon 24, he called Mark a fellow laborer. What a, a title he gives this man. Now turn to 1 Peter chapter 5. First Peter chapter 5, verse 13. The church that is at Babylon. Now, where's Babylon? Well, many times in the book of Revelation, John calls Rome Babylon. This is talking about the church of Rome, and he calls it Babylon. But isn't it glorious how even in this evil place, God's got his church. But look what he goes on to say, and I love this. The church that is at Babylon, elected together with you. <laughs> you know, that was the common conversation of the church. When they were talking about, he's writing this general epistle, he's talking about the church at Babylon for which he was writing. He says, the church at Babylon, elected together together with you. Now that was just the way of conversation in the early church. Look at the way Peter opens this epistle. He says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect. That's how he addressed them. Elect. Thank God for election. Don't you love God? God's electing grace and the election of grace. You wouldn't be saved without it. You can't preach the gospel without God's electing grace. And I love the way, even in his greeting, he says, the church at Babylon elected together with you. You know, I, I can't help it. I, I would like to see somebody come up in the early church and say to somebody, well, I don't believe in election. <laughs> what rock did you crawl out from under? Nobody has any confidence in you. I mean, this is the gospel of God's grace. And the church that's, Babylon, that's at Babylon, elected together with you, salute you. And look what he says next in verse 13. And so doth Marcus, my son. Now, when he calls Marcus his son, I don't have any question that what he's talking about is this man learned the gospel through me. He's... He's, I know the scripture says call no man father, but that is what he meant. Uh, he wasn't, I don't think, I'm sure that uh, Mark never called Peter father, but he was his spiritual son. He learned the gospel through him, and I have no doubt that he spent those years uh, telling Mark exactly what took place during those three years, and uh, he wrote down this first Gospel. Now, this is a gospel addressed to a Gentile audience, perhaps the city of Rome, 
And that makes it different from the other Gospels. Uh, you'll notice that he doesn't give the genealogy of Christ the way Matthew and Mark do because I guess he thought the Romans wouldn't be interested in that. Um, but he begins the gospel with these words, Mark chapter 1, verse 1. Now, he had gone through all this. He, had, he was the young man. He was there when, the, when uh, following the Lord and he, in, in a uh, sheet and it's ripped off of him. He, he runs. He ends up being a deserter. He ends up being a failure. He loses the confidence of everybody. Nobody had any confidence in him because of what he had done. Yet look where the Lord brings him. He's brought back, and like I said, this doesn't have anything to do with second chance. Everything in your life, there's a needs be. There's a must. Everything in my life, there's a needs be. There's a must. It's important. But he brings him to this place in Mark chapter 1, and I, uh, here is the whole gospel in one statement. And this is what we're going to close with thinking about. John was brought through all this. John Mark was brought through all this to write this gospel according to Mark. And I love this first verse. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now what a way to begin. Everything is found in that verse. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The beginning. You know, the Lord said, I am the Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the end. The first and the last. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. The same was, eternally was, in the beginning with God. Colossians 1.18 says, Who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead? Now what him being the beginning means is, well it means a whole lot of things, but it means he's the beginning. He's the source. He's the origin. He's the creator. And let me say this, the gospel is not about you. It's not about your need. It's not about what He can do for you. He is the beginning. You know what that means? He's everything. He's the first. He's the last. He's the alpha. He's the omega. What that means is Jesus Christ is all. Now what does that mean? It means He's all. It means He's all to God. It means He's all in the Scriptures. It means he's all in a sinner's salvation. And understand this, the way a man perseveres in the faith is he perseveres believing that Christ is all. That's all he has. Somebody says, well, Christ is all I have. <laughs> Praise the Lord then. If you have anything else, you won't be saved. That's how serious this is. If, if you have anything else, Christ is not all to you. The only way that Christ is all to you is if you're nothing. And if you're nothing, it's easy for him to be all in. You rejoice in him being all. He is the beginning. The gospel is concerning him. It's not concerning you and your need of him. It's concerning him. It's concerning his glory. Thank God we benefit from that. But he is the beginning. The beginning of the gospel. I love the gospel. It means the Good news. The gospel is good news. That's the only way it can be heard is as good news. Now, what I thought about, I've given this illustration before, but I think it's such a good illustration. The year of Jubilee was supposed to happen every 50 years in the land of Israel, and there's not one instance where they ever observed it. 
Not once. They were supposed to, but they didn't. And I can understand why, because the people that had the money would want not that to happen. They would want to keep it from happening. Hey, I'm going to lose money out of this. I'm going to lose slaves. Let's, let's put it off another year. And they just kept doing it. Like I said, there's not one example of it ever being observed. But in the year of Jubilee, if you're in debt, your debt was canceled. Whatever you lost was returned to you. And if you were a slave, you were set free, and the land was given a year of rest. You were given a vacation. Now, can you imagine if you were in debt and a miserable slave and you'd lost everything, and all you did was work. Can you imagine what that must have sounded like when that silver trumpet of jubilee would blow? Can you imagine? All of a sudden, well, right now, do you owe any, do you, if you owe any money, any money at all, what if there was a sound and all of a sudden those, all that debt was canceled? You owe nothing. Now, who would that be good news to? slave that was in debt and had nothing who would that be bad news to you can figure that out he owes me money you mean it's canceled it's gone he doesn't owe me that money anymore I've got to give this stuff back I'm losing by this some people saw that as bad news there were some people who saw this as the best news they had ever heard. The beginning of the gospel. Now, good news. Listen to this scripture. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Not good people. Not righteous people. Not believing sinners. Not repentant sinners, not what the Puritans called sensible sinners. He just came to save sinners. Who's that good news to? Sinners. Any sinner. And I, let, me, let me give an explanation of that word because somebody says, well, isn't everybody a sinner? No, not in this sense. Uh, or at least they don't think they are. A sinner is somebody who all they do is sin. That's it. They cannot not sin. And they can't put the blame on anybody else. All their sin is all their fault. They don't have any room to look down in judgment on anybody for anything. And they've got no claims on God. If God passed me by and sent me to hell without giving me mercy, just and holy is His name. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Now who's that good news to? Sinners. Anybody else? It's not good news. It's offensive. We don't even like that message. The gospel. I love the definite article, the gospel. There's only one gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ. I love his name. Oh, look what all Mark went through to bring him to where he could give a statement of such glory and magnitude. The gospel of Jesus Christ. I love his name. I, I tell you what, this name Jesus, I, it makes my skin crawl when people use his name flippantly, when they use his name in, a, in an irreverent manner. and just You know, one thing we never see in the New Testament is where anybody, any of his disciples, came up to him personally and called him Jesus. They called him Lord and Master. And the Lord said, you call me Master and Lord, and you do well, for so I am. He's the Lord Jesus Christ. But I love the meaning of Jesus, Savior. 
Savior. Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. And it's the Old Testament, it's the Greek translation of the Old Testament word Joshua. And Joshua, Moses could not bring the children of Israel into the promised land because Moses represents the law. If salvation is by law, me and you ain't getting in. It's not going to happen. Who brought him in? Joshua. He's the one who brought them in. You know the only people that went into the promised land? Did you know there were only three people? As far as the original people? Now I know other people came in, but I'm talking about the ones that were born. Only three people entered the promised land. Joshua, Caleb, and who else? Maybe it's Joshua, maybe it's two people. Yeah, I'm two, I'm wrong, two people. Joshua and Caleb. You know what Caleb's name means? Faithful dog. The Savior and the dog were the only people who got into the promised land. The Lord Jesus Christ, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, what a precious title his office is as Christ. He's the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ as prophet, Christ as priest, Christ as king. I can't hear enough of my need of him in all three of these offices. This is how I need him. He brings me the word of God. He is the word of God. And he spoke like no other Old Testament prophet. They'd all say, thus saith the Lord. He'd say, I say unto you. All the difference in the world. He speaks with the authority of God. He spake as one having authority. That doesn't mean he used a big booming voice. What he said recommended itself as the very word of God. He's a priest like no other priest. I mean these priests that, well, the, the very idea of a priest representing a man before God now is, is offensive. A sinful man representing another sinful man. But here's the point the the Old Testament priests, they bring in the blood of a sacrificial animal. This priest brings his own blood. And it's effectual blood. It's saving blood. You see, if he represents you, you must be saved. And he's a king like no other king. Every other king is described like this. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. You see, every other king it's just there because Christ willed it. And he doesn't have any true authority or power. None at all. Power belongeth unto the Lord. Somebody says, well, he's a powerful man. Don't talk that way. There are no powerful men. Power belongeth unto the Lord. He's the king, the king of kings. And as the rivers of water, the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. As the rivers of water, he turneth it whithersoever he will. He's the king who truly has authority. He's the king whose will is done. And I need him as my prophet to bring me the word of God. I need him as my priest to represent me. I need me as my king to cause me to do his will. The Lord Jesus Christ. And I love what Mark says at last, the son of God. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now let me tell you exactly what that means. You know, the Pharisees got upset with the Lord because he said, My Father worketh hitherto, and I work. And they got upset with that. And you know why they got upset with that? When he called God his father, he made himself equal to God. There's only one person who's equal to God, God. To say he's the son of God is to say he's God Almighty. It's to say he's the creator of the universe. 
is to say he's the controller of providence. Everything that happens is his will being done. He's in control of it. To say he's the son of God is to say you're in his hands and your salvation is up to him. It's not up to you. It's up to him. Now the only thing to do is ask him for mercy. Come to him for mercy. I can tell you this, no one that's ever asked for mercy, truly, has ever been turned down. Never happened. You come to him for mercy, you'll be received. But understand this, your salvation is in his sovereign hand because he is the son of God. God the son. I love um, when... Um, the Ethiopian eunuch had listened to Philip preach the gospel to him. And he was preaching from Isaiah 53. I love that question. Of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself or some other man? Oh, don't you reckon Philip loved getting to tell who that other man is? The Lord Jesus Christ. I would have loved to have heard what all he said to him. But there at the end, they came to a pool of water. And that eunuch said, see, here's water. What doth hinder me from being baptized? That's a good question. And he was thinking, if there's something that, if there's a reason I shouldn't, I want to know. What doth hinder me from being baptized? And Philip said, if you believe, with all your heart, you may. And I love the Ethiopian's answer. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Now, my dear friend, my dear friends, that is what faith is. It's not believing you're saved. It's not believing Christ died for you. It's not believing you're elect. It's not believing you've been born again. It's believing that Jesus Christ is the eternal Son of God. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And you know what? I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. The beginning. Oh, what a statement by Mark. Inspired by God the Holy Spirit. Prepared for this work. The beginning of the gospel. Of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Um, written by this young man clothed in a linen bedsheet. And he gives us his statement I was there, I saw all this happen. Let's pray. Lord, once again, we give thanks for who you are. We give thanks that Christ Jesus, thy blessed Son, is the beginning of the gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Lord, would you create faith in each heart here and enable us to look away from ourself and our experience and the things we naturally think and enable us to behold him, thy son, as the complete Savior, your Christ, your prophet, your priest, and your king, and enable us to trust him as such. In his blessed name we pray, amen.